The beginning of the 21st century sees the world facing unprecedented challenges. Climate catastrophe, overpopulation, technological overdrive, extreme inequality, nuclear terrorism. New challenges call for radically new thinking. Oxford graduate James Martin founded the Oxford Martin School in 2005. We are at an extraordinary crossroads in human history. Our actions or failure to act over the next 20 years will determine the fate of the Earth and civilization for centuries to come. I asked myself, what can I do to help? Very detailed research is needed to understand the problems and to find solutions to them. I looked at various universities and it seemed to me the obvious place to do this was Oxford. Oxford has been at the centre of, of intellectual debate and discourse for centuries and so it is no surprise that we should be looking at these immense challenges that the world faces in the 21st century. The Martin School in many ways has transformed Oxford and the way Oxford works. The Oxford Martin School is really creating a revolution in Oxford. But it's not a revolution that's being resisted, it's a revolution that's being embraced by the university. The mission of the school is to understand the most critical problems facing the world. And as we do so, we find ways to make better futures for all of us. Our progress since the Industrial Revolution has been astounding, at a price. The climate change problem is the biggest market failure that the world has ever seen. When we do push greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, what we do is we inflict costs on other people. And we don't pay for those. So that's why it's a market failure. Economic theory is in a crisis because its very foundations have proved to be inadequate, particularly in the field of macroeconomics and financial economics in predicting or explaining uh, the crash of 2008 and the financial turmoil which is currently prevailing like the euro crisis. The theory just simply couldn't handle that. 33 research institutes within the Oxford Martin School combine intellectual rigour with broad interlinking of perspectives. There's nothing like the Oxford Martin School anywhere in the world and I feel immensely privileged to be the director. And one of the reasons I think that we can be really unique in our ability to provide fresh insights and really advance problem solving and harvest opportunities is because of this ability to bring people from many, many different disciplines together to look at these issues. When you're talking across very different disciplines, what you have to have is time and space to develop a common language so that you can begin to discuss from the very different perspectives what it is that is going to be the core features of the problem you want to address. It's a resilient network uh, of individuals and groups who can connect very easily and very flexibly so it's highly reconfigurable to be able to address problems that emerge. I think it is only the kind of interdisciplinary approach that is proposed, that is going on in the Martin School, that will allow the world to truly understand the nature of these challenges and then to see the options that are available for a path forward. Multidisciplinary scholarship will proffer crucial answers to the potential catastrophes facing us. The reason why I, I joined the Oxford Martin School that it allows me to have that time to think outside the box and develop new, new techniques and I think important techniques. Yes, the Oxford Martin School is, is, um, is allowing a new type of mathematics, stochastic mathematics, to be built into, our, to be the basis of our climate models 
And not only that, it is, um, it is allowing us to develop a synergy between the climate uh, prediction community and the, the supercomputing community. This will, this will just have unbelievably big impacts on how all of the world's modeling centers develop their models and indeed how, indeed how the big supercomputing um, manufacturers, IBM's, Cray's, you know, NEC's, they will see a requirement for this type of stochastic supercomputing and, and it will affect the way they develop also their computers. The Earth now has seven billion people. In three decades it will be nine billion. They will have to be fed. Every year, more land turns to desert. So the main aim of our research has been to enhance the productivity of crops by modifying the root systems. Can we generate root systems in crops that are more efficient at extracting nutrients from the soil? The genes that we have been working on control the formation of cells at the very surface of the root. So this is the interface between the plant and the soil. Our preliminary data indicate that we can increase biomass production in crops by up to 100% by introducing these genes. We'd expected that perhaps we might enhance production by 10, 15, maybe 20%, but the 100% increase really took us by surprise. There, some people have serious ethical issues with the use of GM technology. So being part of the Martin School allows me to sit next to ethical philosophers, political philosophers, developmental economists and discuss these issues. It gives me a hot wire to these people and allows me to discuss in a very open forum the impacts of this research on society and on uh, agriculture. So for me, that's a very important aspect of the multidisciplinarity. Carbon dioxide emissions simply cannot continue at this level. Alternatives have to be found, quickly. The goals of the organic solar cell um, project in the Institute are trying to, aiming to produce very low cost solar cells with printable materials, printable semiconductors, and using abundant non-toxic materials. And this is a prototype of a, a semi-transparent um, solar cell where we're using here a slightly blue dye, so most of the light's actually going through it, and it's absorbing light in the near-infrared region, and this can generate power. And um, the initial application is to create glazing products and windows that will generate power, and this cannot be delivered in such an aesthetic way by other technologies. So we're aiming in the long run to get the cost of solar technology to a fifth of what it is today, which will then actually be less expensive in most areas of Europe than grid-powered electricity that we're paying for today. We've started a company, Oxford Photovoltaics, which is developing the technology at a larger scale than what we do in the lab, and it's also making the right partners in industry as well. The plan is within the next three years, we're at the stage that we can go into manufacture. Within five years, the intention is to have significant shipping of product. The ultimate goal of the school is to find solutions. It's solutions, solutions, solutions. The world's financial edifice is in no better shape than its energy infrastructure. My hope is that the Institute of New Economic Thinking will uh, establish a new base, completely rethink economic theory. The financial system currently poses a profound danger to or a very existence in the sense of uh, uh, the functioning of the economy and of course very far-reaching political uh, impact. So uh, this is one of the most urgent uh, and pressing uh, issues uh, for mankind. Well, I picked Oxford actually because it has got the Martin School, which is a, a looking uh, for innovation in science. So it is a natural home 
uh, for INET. My hope is that the, this institute is laying new foundations for economic theory. I certainly see this as a revolution in, uh, in economics. These forests are far away from the canyons of New York, but they are inextricably bound with our economic system that spews forth so much carbon dioxide. Forests are the lungs of our world. Next to the oceans, they are the biggest absorbers of atmospheric carbon dioxide. We're standing here in the forest canopy at Whiteham Woods, which is Oxford University's uh, research forest just outside of Oxford. And here uh, we're looking at how the forest functions, how climate change is affecting the forest, and improving our understanding of the carbon and nutrient cycling and the physiology of these forests with the aim of improving models and predictions of how the biosphere will respond to 21st century climate change. And Whiteham here is simply one hub of a global network of over 40 sites, predominantly in tropical forests around the world, where we are replicating exactly the methods and the research that we're doing here. And uniquely, we've taken these techniques, honed them, into a very adaptable, practical form and taking them to the far-flung but very important parts of the biosphere, the tropical rainforests of South America, of the Congo Basin uh, and of Borneo and a number of other locations. And, and also the scale of our effort with over 40 different locations is orders of magnitude larger than any, any similar work that's been done, done before. One aspect with the school has particularly uh, pushed my work in a new direction is through the strong link, linking my scientific research much more strongly with policy and governance issues. That, that's been a unique combination of science and policy. Our planet is in the midst of the biggest extinction of plants and animals since the end of the Pleistocene. We destroy biodiversity at our peril. And the reason it's so important is that it, 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 it's basically provides everything that we need for, for, for life on Earth, both through its provisioning services, through the foods, the diversity of foods and drugs particularly, and also through the diversity, through what it provides in terms of regulating services like carbon, carbon regulation, clean water is another one, uh, nutrient cycling, all of those require a biodiverse planet. There are two key pressures on biodiversity right now. One of them is global warming and the second one is land use change moving to biofuel production is putting even more pressure on the biodiverse land, certainly the first generation uh, biofuel crops, and that's a big problem. It is possible to conserve biodiversity beyond protected areas, and we are developing the tools and technologies to do this. Now we need to get those tools and technologies into the hands of the people that are making the, having the biggest impact on biodiversity. The Oxford Martin School for me has been a real eye-opener. It's a very positive, very pragmatic, very forward-looking and it's enabling almost a revolution in the way that we work in Oxford. Food for the world. Energy. Economics. Forest conservation. Biodiversity. All are linked and need a coherent world view. Oxford has tremendous strength in almost every discipline. It doesn't matter if it's in the sciences or the humanities or the social sciences. Across the whole range, we're very good at uh, most disciplines we turn our hands to, but we don't typically connect those different disciplines together. And it's really the school that's enabled that to happen. Geoengineering is, I think, is absolutely perfect for the, for the school structure. It's really something we couldn't tackle by staying in our bunkers. At the moment, I am not optimistic about society's ability to curtail its carbon emissions. Carbon keeps rising in the atmosphere and our emissions are growing year on year. I, I, we're, not, we're not gonna stop at 450 ppmv, which is the target many governments have, have set. So I think we will head towards six or 700. A 700 atmospheric carbon dioxide count would be catastrophic. 
I would rather we didn't have to geoengineer, but it may become necessary to do so. Our most active research at the moment is, is in the South Atlantic, through an area where there's a great deal of ocean productivity, but there is um, no real understanding of how the iron that's required for that productivity is getting into the seawater. Is it coming from dust? Is it coming from rivers? How is the biology using it? We'll bring back something like eight tonnes of seawater with us from that cruise, shipping it back to our clean lab here to make the measurements of iron. We may start to learn whether we can manipulate the iron cycle to our advantage. Can we try adding additional iron to increase the amount of phytoplankton? And because phytoplankton are carbon-based, they're consuming carbon and removing that carbon from the atmosphere. Society is not yet beginning to comprehend the economic and social consequences of 21st century science. Quantum information science draws on quantum physics in general to promise a, ra a range of technologies whose fundamental design principles are very, very different than conventional technologies. I'll tell you about some recent work uh, from our own group dealing with with room temperature quantum mechanics because I'm very excited by it. The particular case that we have done is to take two diamonds, which has a certain resonance on its own, you know, one, one likes to, to have diamonds in the laboratory, but, but they have a particular feature. Diamond's very stiff, which means that it vibrates very rapidly. You, you knock it and it vibrates extremely rapidly. Uh, and that gives you the opportunity to look for quantum mechanical features in those vibrations. Uh, and we can do that using extremely short light pulses, pulses that are of a duration of about a billion billionth of a second long. So we make those light pulses, we use them to effectively this little hammer, start this diamond ringing, and then we come in with a second pulse and use that to probe the, uh, the oscillation. And by doing so, we can demonstrate that the diamonds are quantum correlated. We have two of them and we can show that we can uh, entangle these two by delocalizing the vibrational oscillation between them. So I, I'm very excited by that idea. The practical applications for this science are as yet unclear, but the implications are immense. When I look toward the future, my methodology is different from what I see almost everywhere else. My approach is to ask what do the laws of physics permit? This differs from an attempt to understand what people will do, or dates, or timelines, or social impacts. It's a foundation for understanding 21st century technology, and a point of departure for understanding these more difficult problems. The emerging technology prospect for the surprisingly near future is an atomically precise manufacturing technology that will change the relationship of our civilization to the material world as deeply as did the Industrial Revolution. Civilization has always lived with pandemics. Today, burgeoning population, overcrowded shanty towns, and air travel are the perfect formula for a lethal contagion. Bioterrorism is another 21st century threat. I think it's entirely possible that there could be another very serious event with an emerging infectious disease like 1918 flu. The work we're doing as it, within the Oxford Martin School is really we're interested in how and why new infectious diseases uh, emerge. So that is, how do they come to cause real problems for human beings? And the reason we do that is that the emerging infections are capable of being really a, a serious threat to people and one that's hard to predict. And one of the reasons they're hard to predict is that we don't have a good way of telling which infections will cause real problems for humans and which won't. Being in the Martin School has been just made a huge difference to what we do. So in particular, I mean, everything we do is a collaboration between mathematical biologists like myself and clinicians like my co-director, Rodney Phillips. And before the Oxford Martin School came along, we had worked together, we talked together a lot, but we'd never had any shared appointments. And since being part of the Oxford Martin School, we've had lots of people who we've co-supervised. We've done much, much more work together. The school gives people the space for unconventional, original thinking. I'm a molecular biologist working in the physics department because my research 
is about cancer research. What happens in cancer research at the, cert at the level of the cell, the tissue, and I'm working on nanotechnology as a new approach, as a new, as a, it could be an evolution of medicine to something new. I sometimes I do chemistry, physics, biology, and it's not normal, but I did it because the James Martin School community of people like me. STEM cell technology is going to be one of the great medical advances of the 21st century. The possibilities are endless. The major role of the Oxford's Cancer Stem Cell Institute is to bring together people in Oxford with fairly diverse interests, ranging from cancer to neuronal stem cells to regenerative medicine in the heart or in, in, in connective tissues and so on. All our cells in our body have the have the information to encode us. It's just that parts of the information are, are suppressed and, and parts of it are active, are actively being read at any one time. But the whole information is always there. Even a cell from the skin or from a tail can generate every kind of cell in an animal and the animal is actually functional. The difference between a liver cell and a skin cell is that some genes in the liver are active they're inactive in the skin cell and the other way around. They share certain genes that are active or inactive. Um, so the challenge was to, to realize that you can take a cell which is very specialized, where only a subset of genes are active, and somehow reprogram it back to a basal state where now everything's possible again, and it becomes more like an egg. You could see maybe with the appropriate approaches as speeding up a little bit that, that lifespan ex expectancy from what, 100, 115, 120, 125 maybe. Maybe in 50 years we will all be living, or many people will be living to 120. And that in itself creates issues for society. All this technological development, all this economic growth, all this scientific progress, like what's the end game here? Like what are we aiming for? because there is very little serious thought happening on that. I think that's a, a failure of, of the current generation. Trying to discover all crucial considerations uh, that are relevant when you're thinking about the future of humanity and our overall sort of macro strategic position um, is the great challenge that uh, the Future of Humanity Institute is, is grappling with. If we do get, say, advanced molecular nanotechnology, advanced machine intelligence, then a lot of things could happen quickly after that because they would unleash a lot of technological potential quickly. It could sort of telescope the future back in to a very short period of time. If we do get machines that were much smarter than us doing that, then the developments would happen on computer timescales rather than on biological human timescales. This is actually a subject matter where you need to have some of the best uh, minds of our generation thinking really long and hard. Radical changes in technology are changing our notions of nuclear conflict. There was a, a strand of thinking about nuclear weapons that became somewhat outdated. And we think there is um, an opportune moment now, partly because of political realities, technological developments, to look at this set of questions again. The old way of thinking about nuclear weapons, who have rather dramatically over the past couple of years started to talk about global zero, about elimination. Uh, and that causes you to think about the problem from a completely different starting point. There hasn't been as much um, political innovation, if you will, innovation in political institutions as we might require. Um, and that's an area of thinking that we at ELAC would like to investigate further. Um, options for not just reform of existing institutions, but possibilities for creating new institutional solutions. Extreme developments in technology without a moral framework will cause chaos. My prime concern about the 21st century is that we survive to the end of it without any kind of disaster. The future of the human species is in our hands. And this is a scary prospect because we know that the human race can't come to any consensus even about obvious uh, imperatives like reducing gross inequalities in the world. 
Science is extremely important to understanding the world, understanding its forces, but science alone, knowledge of the world, can never tell us what we should do. To do that, we need a set of values, and that's what we study. So the values that we have impact on our cities, on our environment, on every single pattern of human activity. The problems today we have are of massively powerful technology, biological weapons that could dwarf smallpox in terms of their potency and global collective action problems. Problems that require cooperation of millions of people all around the world to deal with problems like poverty and climate change. But we don't have the psychology to deal with those problems. We also don't have the morality. Yeah, we really need a, a, a Copernican revolution in the way in which we think about value in societies. We could destroy civilization as we know it. We could create a new dark age. But also, if we got it right, we could create a magnificent new renaissance. It is astounding how little time is spent thinking about the future. It really is, to me, one of the great puzzles. By thinking about the future, you can have much better outcomes. You can ensure that we avoid the massive dangers of the cliffs that we could walk over. Oxford has been a leader for centuries. Oxford remains a world leader in all areas of intellectual inquiry, and I am absolutely confident that it will be a world leader in the 21st century, particularly in tackling these most challenging problems that the world faces in this new century. And the reason that Oxford will be there in such strength and with such impact is because of the Oxford Martin School.